I'm still Ed Greenspawn, as I was <laughs> earlier when I saw you. Um, but now joined by Lisa Reit and Anne McClellan, who are co-chairs of the Coalition for a Better Future, which is um, uh, an entity that uh, they will uh, uh, explain that has, uh, uh, it's kind of a little bit like a coalition government uh, that Anne and uh, <laughs> no, Lisa are. Not at uh, all, actually. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think it is. I believe it has a, a, a um, confidence and supply agreement. We're confidence agreement. That's you guys funny. have so much confidence and supply in each other. So um, <laughs> they have um, worked with a whole bunch of people, including me, uh, to to try to get a sense of, you know, how do we push forward a growth agenda in Canada? And here we are um, at a growth summit. And I'll just say that the growth summit started, the first one was in 2016. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that we were kind of going, the country's, you know, on a path, a known path, an accepted path towards 2% annual growth. And it didn't seem good enough to provide a you know, a good future to people. So that first um, growth summit was called Beyond 2%, and it was, you know, what can we do to get us up and above Beyond 2%? So let's start there. What can we do to accelerate growth? What are, you know, the one or two priorities that that's mattering to you as you go uh, across the country and talk to a lot of people, or that you're picking up, you know, as yeah. you do that? And First of all, let me say that I think we're picking up an awful lot yeah. of just information and wealth of knowledge. And I have got to say, and Dr. Degagne, so nice to see you again, Mike. And the last panel speaks, I think, to uh, at least some part of what we're hearing around inclusion, right? Um, the coalition is built around 131 different organizations, private sector, nonprofit, charitable sector. and. Um, our, our work together is about focusing like a laser on inclusive, sustainable economic growth. And when we travel across the country, just a couple of the things that <clears throat> I've picked up on, um, talent and inclusion, you know, the last panel. We're not going to be able to generate the economic growth, the high quality economic growth that we need and want unless we figure out the talent equation and how we include all Canadians and their productive capacity. So inclusion is a really important word for us at the coalition. Um, the other important word is sustainable economic growth. And I'm gonna let Lisa talk about the sustainable part of our economic growth. but. Another idea that has been discussed here and elsewhere when we traveled across the country virtually with the PPF uh, sessions last fall, the digitalization of the Canadian economy, mm -hmm. right? Everybody agrees on the fact that we need to incent private sector, but civil society and all levels of government to digitize uh, and that to Mike's point earlier, is not unrelated to inclusion around connectivity and uh, digital literacy and the ability to fully participate in the economy. So I, I'm struck by, and maybe it's not by accident, Ed, that so many of the sessions here today are directly related to what we're seeing and hearing at the coalition. But Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. To answer the question that you asked, which was, how do we grow more than 2%? What we, what we learned as we brought together the advisory council to the Coalition for a Better Future is that the how to do it kind of has been mapped out. I mean, PPF has done reports. We have a wonderful report chaired by Mark Little and uh, Monique, Monique LaRue. LaRue. We have as well Dominic Barton's work from the government. There has been a lot of study about what we must do as a country in order to have that kind of growth that isn't tepid, that's actually going to be there for us. What Anne and I and the coalition talk about is, okay, there's gonna be growth, there has to be growth, but this time the growth needs to be sustainable and inclusive, and it's gotta be bigger than what we've been getting in the mm -hmm. past. And as she pointed out, 131 organizations are pulling in the same direction on this notion, which we need to have a conversation about economic growth. It needs to be forefront. And we also want to define what it, what it looks like. And for me, the biggest surprise across the country has been how well this has been received yep. and how many people want to be 
informed and part of what's going on because they too value uh, larger economic growth in this country. So do you think there's, um, there's enough urgency and, and I think in terms of both of your uh, political careers, you know, and you were involved at a time uh, early in your political career mm -hmm. when there was a fiscal crisis in Canada and there was urgent mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, you were involved at a time uh, when the great financial That's crisis right. occurred mm -hmm. yep. and there was a need for urgent action, the pandemic, we've seen it again. When there's a crisis, I mean, things get done. Um, is this that kind of situation, Anne? It's interesting you would raise that. We were talking mm -hmm. about this last night. Um, I was part of the Chrétien Martin government when we dealt with the debt crisis and hitting the debt wall. Um, COVID, another kind of crisis. Uh, I think we are at a crisis point, an inflection point, but it's not that kind of obvious crisis, right? I call this more of a creeping crisis, right? We're creeping along 1.8 annual growth, maybe two, right now higher obviously because we're coming out of COVID. Um, but I think uh, it's, it's fair to say that this is a crisis, this is an inflection point. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by what Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne said this morning. He described himself as impatient. Mm -hmm. I, I took that to heart and took that away because I think we need to be impatient right now. That doesn't mean we should be rash or thoughtless. We need to be quite thoughtful. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be impatient about what we need to do to generate the inclusive, sustainable economic growth we need to ensure the quality of life that we all want for our families and communities. So this is, for me, an inflection point. Maybe it's a slow-moving crisis, and I don't want us to have to wait until we're in a situation like 95, 96 uh, to, to feel that urgency and actually do the things we know we can do. Yeah, there was, we felt unease last summer that there wasn't enough attention being put on economic growth writ large. And that's kind of what brought us together at the beginning. There was an unease. Nick Nanos has a poll out today. And that unease has now been made itself known amongst the Canadian populace. There's a lot of folks out there worried about housing, worried about inflation. When you have that kind of unease in the general population, you definitely have to pay attention to the fact that economic growth is something that is positive and something to grab onto to help make people feel more comfortable. Like they may be in a position where they're saying, I'm very nervous about inflation, but look, the economy is going in the right way. I can feel that we're growing and good things are happening and there's great announcements and companies are investing and I feel like there's a future. And that offsets the unease. If you only have unease, then you're gonna have a chaotic time for both political parties and as well for what's happening in society. Well, it, it seems also quite possible, and we've talked about this a little bit uh, previously in some of the advisory group meetings that you guys have chaired, uh, you know, there's a disconnect between growth in the economy and lack of growth in people's personal incomes. Mm. So, you know, people have gone a long time with rather stagnant incomes. And, mm -hmm. you know, so do we need to make this more abstract, that it's about living standards, right? Well, it's one of the three parts of the, uh, of the scorecard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Living better. Yeah, okay, well. Yeah, yeah. let's put up the let's, scorecard. Let, what? We can put the let's scorecard up. Let's put up the scorecard yeah. and we yeah. can talk about that in the context. There. So what it comes down to is it's not just about saying we need more economic growth. It's not identifying what kind of economic growth. It's the fact that we've, there's a lot of talking heads out there, including myself and Anne, but this time we're going to measure it, and we're going to measure it with these 21 different metrics yeah. that are going to be able to let us know if we're going in the right direction. And you can see on the inner circle, I can't see because I don't have my glasses yeah. on, but you can see that it breaks it out into what Anne said, growing sustainably, and then the- Living better. Living better and winning globally. Winning. But living better is the key. When people feel they're living better. Um, my kids probably feel that economic growth in this country is a given, and of course they're gonna do better than their mom. I'm not really convinced that's the case but I sure as heck want to give it a shot. Yeah, and oh, the scorecard has disappeared because Lisa and I travel. But, to the extent, can we keep the scorecard yeah. up for all things? Uh, we travel with it everywhere. Uh, we don't have a lot of props, but we travel with the scorecard everywhere. 
And in fact, these 21 metrics, some of which are well known, some actually, I would say, uniquely Canadian, um, in fact, they speak to the uh, progress that we need to see in Canadian society to get us to a place in 2030 where we believe that we are competing with the best in class around the world. And each one of those 21 has a target behind it for 2030. And starting this fall, we are going to independently verify the progress being made in relation to each one of those 21 metrics. And this is not to punch, uh, punish governments or private sector or civil society. This is about accountability, and we hope the most positive way. And up until 2030, we are going to measure the success in terms of meeting each one of those targets because we believe each one of them is going to be required to have that sustainable, inclusive economic growth that should drive us all. Yeah. And that is our concrete deliverable as a coalition so far coming out of our economic summit last fall. And when we talk to elected officials, they all have our scorecard, right, Lisa? They've got it on their wall. They've got it. The Prime Minister had it in his hand. It was almost too small for him to read, but he read it. Yeah, and well, it might be too small for some people to read up on here. So where can they see it? Where can they find it? They can go on our website, yeah. www.coalitionforabetterfuture.org. Dot org, I think. Okay, or you or, or, or can use search okay. and, yeah. and, okay. and, 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 and you will get there. Yeah. Um, um, so you mentioned 2030, Anne, and um, I think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's because 2030 is an important target year in terms of yeah. um, sustainability and uh, the Paris uh, Agreement. But how does the energy transition, you know, we, ha we, have, we have certain things that, you know, we got to get done. Mm -hmm. We got to get an energy transition done. Mm -hmm. We also have certain things being imposed on us, so we'll come back to that, like the Ukrainian uh, uh, crisis that sort of divides the world and other geopolitical um, um, challenges that we we're facing even beforehand, access to the United States, uh, problems with China. But, le but let's just start with energy for a moment. So is that a spur to the kind of growth you're looking for? Is that a drag on the kind of growth you're looking for? Does that depend on how we manage it? Well, it shouldn't be a drag. No. And in fact, it is about how we manage it. Nobody's talking, oh, at least, uh, excuse me, maybe some people, but as far as I can tell, governments aren't talking about uh, limiting production. What they're talking about is capping emissions. Mm -hmm. And what that does, and you see with the, the budget of 2022 with the investment tax credit that Alex was talking about earlier, what you see is a focus on incenting the private sector in partnership with governments, hopefully at least two orders, the federal and provincial governments, incenting them to make the big investments in things like carbon capture and storage, in things like hydrogen, um, in things like methane capture. Mm -hmm. And so, Look, I live in Alberta, but, uh, and, but Lisa and I are both former ministers of natural resources. Um, I am not one of those who believes you strand all those assets uh, that can help be part of the energy transition if done right and if we work in partnership and collaboration and incent the right things. Yeah, not a drag, opportunity. Recognize it as an opportunity. We have resources, we have capabilities, we have lots of innovation. And one point about that scorecard, this isn't about measuring governments or partisan political no. parties. That scorecard should be in the hands of every CEO. Yes, in the absolutely. As well. They should be looking at that scorecard because there's a lot of metrics in there on, on innovation, on investment, yeah. on emission reductions that are important as well as part of the total economic fiber. The, the important part about the uh, about the energy transition is that it is real and it's happening and private sector knows it's happening, government wants it to happen. And as we manage this, we'd like to see growth come out of it. We believe growth should come out of it. 131 organizations want growth to come out of it and it should be the right way. That said, um, it's gonna require a lot of investment. Yeah. We've seen uh, various reports, not scorecards, but reports over the past year uh, that 
you know, say that investment has been uh, down in Canada, that Canada has not been as attractive uh, uh, for investment. So what, Lisa, if it's not all to government, which I obviously will agree, but what does government need to do and what does the private sector, let's say, as two you know, yeah. huge drivers of, of being attractive to investment need to do to get that investment, to turn this into an opportunity? The projects need to be de-risked. And that is a combination of institutional lenders, it's a combination of companies, it's a combination of banks and government sending the right signals to markets that this is something you can trust, you can invest in, it is not a risky proposition, it's not a risky venture, that you are still going to be able to have uh, all of your boxes checked in terms of making sure you're doing what your shareholders want to do. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, it is something that can be trusted. And every single entity does have a role to play in that. It's not just the government and it's not just companies. But the government has a big role to play in helping to de-risk. And since, um, um, since you started, and we spoke earlier today here about, uh, about uh, the war on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it the war on Ukraine right, rather than yeah. the war in Ukraine. I like it. Um, you know, this has occurred. It leads to a greater schism in the global economy. Mm -hmm. um, we've already had supply, signs, supply chains disrupted by, um, uh, by the pandemic and a, a new supply side nationalism. So I think the um, uh, economy in the world is trying to re find a new balance and rebalance itself. What, what do you think that this geopolitical um, challenges mean to Canada and, and its growth path? Mm. Um, probably a higher degree of uncertainty, at least in the short term, than we would like. But um, last evening we had the opportunity to talk about um, allies and the fact that if you look at supply chains, um, people, whether it was our budget, Madame Freeland used the language of allies. Mm -hmm. The un President of the United States, or at least his spokesperson, used the language of allies. Mary Barra, GM. And Mary Barra at GM, private sector CEO, talking about allies. Mm -hmm. Now, that is different language, isn't it, in terms of the globalization writ large. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I think the opening up of global economies, I remember Peter Pettigrew, you know, as Minister of Trade 20 some years ago, being trapped in Seattle with all the anti-globalization protesters. But we took globalization on board. Maybe we thought it was going to promise more than ultimately it did. Maybe it left too many parts of the world and too many people behind. But I think whatever globalization's form was is now being disrupted. And countries and governments don't necessarily like disruption, especially in established trade patterns, trading partners, and so on. But I think this language, and it was Lisa last night who really put this into focus, this concept of allies and the fact that we need to look for perhaps new and different allies who will form the basis of new trading blocks and trading relationships and partnerships. And Jan Psaki used the language of allies when she was asked a question at the White House about critical minerals and the development of electric vehicles. And her answer was about allies, right? Working with allies. And I think that language is going to become more prevalent and we're going to have to wait and see exactly what that means and maybe even who some of our allies are. I know, I know our time is short, but I want to give uh, an example of uranium. Yep. I know you sat on the board of Cameco and you know it really well, but in the world, if we're moving towards SMRs, if we're tr moving towards uh, zero emission power from, from nuclear sources, uh, you know, there's Canada with a wonderful plentiful amount of uranium. And then you have Kazakhstan, which has a lot of uranium. But that uranium is processed in Russia. So guess what's going to happen? You have to look to where the actual resource is. And Canada is going to be an allied partner for France, for the UK, for the for United Japan. States. For Well, Japan, if they, if, yeah, if they, they get their reactors back, back up and running. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's a, that's a big deal. That's a really big change. And it's something that we need to be that we need to keep top of mind. And you know, Tim Gitzel at Cameco gets it. He's mm -hmm. out there talking about it on the world stage. So Canada's ready, we're, we're, we know what's going on. Yeah, I, I, I agree um, uh, that it's, 
you know, there's a couple of opportunities here in how geopolitics change. One is that the United States needs allies in a way it didn't before, where if we're back in a Cold War, like Canada mattered in the Cold War previously, and your allies do matter when you're facing an external, uh, an external menace. Um, at the same time, as you say, Russia and China are big suppliers of things that Canada has, so you know, we are an alternate, safer supplier, which has been an argument even in oil and gas for, yeah. uh, for a long, long time. On the other hand, you have a very uh, restive United States uh, uh, politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have midterm elections, and uh, there's people who feel left out by globalization, and President Biden and uh, both parties are, are, are appealing to them. So I guess we'll see um, how, the, at least there's a counter pressure to that now. Yeah. Like. yeah, but I think the private sector has stepped into the vacuum, and they started doing that a number of years ago at the at the at COPS and they are definitely aware of what's going on and, and I think that the world where one government can completely disassemble what the previous government did, that may not be yeah. the case in energy transition. I have I have faith that the private sector is moving it faster in a different direction. Okay, well I see why everybody wants to talk to you because uh uh, you're knowledgeable and optimistic, and people want to have a basis. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't mean unrealistic, I mean optimistic, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So thank you uh, both very much for the work you're doing and for being with us today. Our pleasure. My and pleasure, our pleasure. <laughs>